Darren, let me take you back to Selhurst Park on May the 4th, 2013. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what, what were the thoughts that were going through your head on that, on that final whistle? <sighs> I, I didn't know what was going on um, at Huddersfield Barnsley. Through the game, I'm watching the game in America with my, my boy, mm. you know, who's with me, and um, I'd been checking Twitter a little bit for score updates and stuff, and, and, and the Sky Sports app, and uh, I knew with the crowd's reaction, a 2-1 up, obviously, listen, job done, happy, a 2-2, two, two, we're still cheering. So I knew, obviously, things were going our way. Um, even at 3-2, you could still think, if they're still cheering, things could be going our way, you know what I mean? And uh, I knew at the silence, and the players looking like if there was a death in the family, you know, one minute to go that we were down. Um, and obviously the pictures came in then of Luke Steele playing kickabout with the football, you know, uh, in the Huddersfield Barnsley game. So what was going through my head? Um, a bit of shock. My son was with me, so I had to hold my emotions in check. I probably wanted to cry. Um, but, you know, you're a seven-year-old, so you've got to be strong. Um, so I actually had my secretary drive him home from my office. So I stayed in the office for an hour or two just to get my head around it. But I'm that type of guy that by the time I walk in my front door when I get home, I never take my work home with me. I never, my wife will always tell you, she'll never know if there's bad things or good things happening in my life, my business life or whatever else, because, uh, you know, as a married person with children, the ups and downs, it's, it's, it's not fair to them. So when I got home, she knew. Um, but probably by six o'clock, I had a beer, and I was already thinking of the next season and what we had to do. A lot of people would probably be throwing the towel and, you know, uh, want to go and hide themselves in the dark room for a long time. But no, my, my natural attitude has always been with setbacks in my life. You know, I don't believe in the word failure. There's no such thing as failure, only setback. And it was a massive setback because you really feel aggrieved with 54 points, which is probably in the Guinness Book of Records. That will never, ever be achieved again for a team that goes down. Um, 54 points was pretty much what we'd aimed for as a target. We wanted a 20% improvement on the 15% uh, improvement on the previous year which I think was 55 points or 57 points. So we pretty much achieved a lot of the things we wanted to achieve. And, and you almost feel it's cruel, like, because we'd lost 14 of the first 18 games. Why bring us through that? You'd rather have gone down with a record low number of points, you know, because the elation of getting your act together, being one of the top four teams in the championship from January through to May, only to be relegated with the last kick of the season. It was probably the cruelest thing that's ever happened. Was it a, a um, conscious effort that you stayed in America for that? Because usually you'd come back for the last game of the season. Was it a conscious effort to stay in America for that final game? Yeah, um, I, I come to all the really, really important games. Um, uh, I've also got a certain amount of days I can only be in the UK per year and I've been over for when the final home game. Um, it was a conscious effort. Um, I wanted to be there, I couldn't be. Um, but, you know, uh, it's probably just as well I wasn't there. <laughs> and I did speak to the manager. Um, 20 minutes after the final whistle. And I said, whatever you do, when you get on that coach, there's gonna be a lot of mourning going on on the coach. And there's gonna be a lot of those players are gonna be with us next year. And you mustn't let them get off the coach without something to hold on to. And you gotta tell them that we can learn from it and we can come back stronger from this. And it's a setback. And hopefully it's a nine month setback. And it would take us nine months to get back out of the league one and back to the championship because we owe it to ourselves, our fans, and I think the, fo the football gods owe it to us, so to speak. So that's how I felt. The manager obviously took it worse than anyone else. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, you know. Um, it, it took a bit of persuading for me to get him out of how he was feeling, <laughs> you know, but probably because I went in hard in those first few days about next year, next year, and he didn't even want to talk about next year or didn't want to talk about football. He was just completely flat. From it. I mean, is that is that something that's going through your head at that time? After that, is like you know, you know, the manager's going to be deflated. You know, will he want to leave? Will he want to? Yeah, I, I thought I, I thought the manager would want out, and he pretty much did. You know, but that was, and he'll tell you that himself. Um, he told me, you know, it was very because I'm talking about winning the league next year, and he was talking about it. Uh, uh, you know, no, <laughs> you know, I'm. I'm I forced him into talk, and he didn't want to talk football. And in hindsight, I shouldn't have talked football with him. But that's me. I, I, I want to get back on the horse. I've fallen off. I want to get back up. That's my style. Mm. Other people aren't like that. And, you know, you have to be fair. He's a human being. He wasn't like that. He was just he, he had the crap kicked out of him. You know, from that. He, he really genuinely thought we wouldn't go down. He really, really genuinely thought we wouldn't lose the game. And um, it, it was probably the most devastating thing that happened in his football life. And it's a young football life as a manager still. Um, so. 
after hearing that and whatever, I had to leave him alone again. And then I went about doing what I do with my gaffer. I, I psychologically played a game of, I send him emails, I send him little tidbits, I, you know, give him a little bit of this and that, hope-wise, and, and all the good things. And I did that over a period of time. And all of a sudden, then uh, a week later, he's ringing me going, listen, you know, I've got my head out of my ass. Are you right? You know, let's do this again. And I owe it to you, I owe it to the club, and let's get back up. You speak, uh, you speak there talking about you picking the, the manager mm. up. Who picks you up? No one. My wife would pick me up in life, but there's no one's job to pick me up. When you, when you take the responsibility, this is something now I can preach to people who want to own their own business and be their own leaders and be their own people. When you take the responsibility and the brave decision to work for yourself, to be a leader, to be in charge, you must take the responsibility. A certain amount of that comes with loneliness, um, i.e. there's nobody usually you can go to for advice and there's nobody usually who will pick you up. So you have to be strong enough to take that on. And if you are strong enough to take it on, you'll be successful. Where you won't be successful is if you feel sorry for yourself and you let things like that finish you off and bury you. It's not in my nature, it's not who I am. Um, I'm still a young man, but from a very young age I worked for myself and I took that responsibility on. When I lost my mother, when I was probably well, 26, it changed everything in my life and the way I looked at life, from my personal life to my business life, and I took on a, a fearless attitude. Yeah, an attitude of I don't care about, you know, setbacks about failure so to speak even though I don't think it exists I didn't care if for me it was all about I can succeed I can succeed I can make things happen and I'll be brave enough to make things happen and if I fall short doesn't matter I'll go again so that's me I don't need people to pick me up I'm not gonna lie to you there are times where I feel like a football fan not suicidal um, I just I feel down and whatever that's but I, I get myself out of that slumber and where my wife is great is her and the kids will make me feel like a very normal person again in other words, listen, you know, get rid of the ego, get rid of all of that nonsense and whatever else. You're not D Mac, you know, whatever's your D. And you're a dad and you're my husband. And you know, big shot in this house. So, you know, bring yourself back down to earth and whatever and let's get on with things and let's do normal things. When you talk about relegation, everyone mm. obviously sees the the image of dropping down a league. What's the what's the bigger picture of relegation? It's massive because we we always felt um a club like Peterborough United um, has to stay in the championship for a four or five year period to build its crowds. People can talk about reduced prices, reduced prices, reduced prices, give the tickets away, they'll come. They don't, it's nonsense. You always have a club like Peterborough have a hardcore set of fans with about four and a half thousand. But no matter what happens, even if there's an earthquake, they'll still come and watch us play. If I charged a hundred quid a ticket, they would come and watch us play. And they are the best fans you could ask for. What I need is, is the championship gives us the floating fans, the away crowds. It gives us the average that we can build on. Yeah, it would have been, I think, nearly 9,000 average last season. I, th I just thought with the team, it was, it was the youngest f team by average in the Football League out of 72 clubs with an average age of 21.4 months. And I just felt with a year later, another year after 54 points and achieving what we achieved and with that run of form from January, that we would have gone into our third season in a row in the championship. Our crowds would have gone up over the 10,000 mark, in my opinion. We would have been a team, we wouldn't have sold Dwight Gale. In the back of my mind, I actually wanted to bring Craig McHale Smith back to pair him with Dwight Gale. That was my master plan for the season coming up. Yes, he was injured now, but it was like my, in my head, that was, you know, I thought them two together, wow, you know? Um, so we had great plans in place that we could really kick on, add to the squad we already had, um, and we really felt we'd have a top 10 finish in year three. And then we felt by year four, the crowds would be then up to 11,000, and maybe we could flirt with the playoffs. That to a city in a club like Peterborough is massive because even if you then get relegated after four or five years, by being up to that 11,000 average, you've, the floating fans have become part of the hardcore 4,500, so now it's a hardcore 6,500. Everything changes and it gives us a better budget, it gives us a better pop, the stadium can be redeveloped quicker, you know, you've got an all-seater stadium, everything goes in place. That kick in the nuts, what happened at Palace, just set us back massively because it's not that we didn't expect it, it's just that the way we were playing, the team we were building, we could only see great things happening. I'm a big believer in the big man upstairs, he obviously had a plan. He's tortured me since Crystal Palace <laughs> to the very day right up till today, so I don't know what his plan is, but I can only stick to my guns and my plans and get back there as quick as we can because the, the financial loss is nearly six million quid dropping ahead of the championship and to a club our size with the with the small crowds we get, it's uh, people will tell you out there, it's quite miraculous what we've done as a football club and people don't really give us enough credit for that. And, and, and that's why I never feel too sorry for us about being sixth in the league and people moaning about our underachieving this season because 
there's 23 clubs in League 2 who'd love to be in our position. There's the 18 or 15 other clubs in League 1 who'd love to be in our position. So, you know, what could have been is gone now and I can only dream the odd time about what we could have done this year in the Championship and you see what Burnley have done in the Championship this year. For me, it wasn't as tough as it was last year, the league. And I think I'm improved right. If you look at the teams and the points and in the playoffs, we would have had a magnificent chance, you know what I mean, of having a great season. So that's gone now. We had to get over the hangover and we had to go into this season and we had to get rid of that hangover and we had to, to re-energise and get on with the season in hand. Part of that re-energising was mm. obviously rebuilding, mm. uh, restructuring. Uh, you lost some key personnel in, in Dwight Gale, Alex Pritchard. I don't know Pritchard was mm. only on loan, but he was, a, he was a key player. We had a deal to keep Pritch, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, I mean... Gailey had to go, you know, you know, we knew we had a £6 million hole to fill and we had to rebuild as well and bring players in. Um, and once, it, once the Premier League clubs that wanted to buy him were in, in, you know, in negotiating, he was getting sold, no doubt about that. So that deal allowed us to get through this season properly, but also to go out and spend £3 million on transfers. So there was still a net deficit even after all that, we either to put money in again. But we knew that. Um, and we bought Brit, a replacement for Dwight. Um, who we feel can be just as good if not better than Dwight. Uh, Alex Pritchard, we felt we had a chance of buying him as a championship club. And then we were speaking to Alex and his dad about coming on loan. But Tim Sherwood uh, absolutely killed that deal and wouldn't let it happen. He had to go to Swindon, um, even though pre-season we felt he was coming to us. And we were going to pay all his wages to come to us. So that was a real gutter and something I'm, I'm still not happy about. Um, because Pritch is a great player. And I just think he would have been something different for us this season, you know, particularly with the loss of Tom Owen Boydie last season. So for Sale of A, <coughs> that's gone. We were happy to get Payne in, um, who we feel is going to be a great player for Peter for a long time. Britt was one we wanted. Um, we were happy to, you know, be able to spend money in the right places. So it was important, but it was almost like, you know, you gamble a lot to get back out of the league straight away. And that's always the danger, you know, because you don't want to be stuck in League One for two, three years, you know, suddenly it becomes run of the mill. Like before, you want to bounce back as quick as you mm. can. Who were your key targets that summer? Um, two strikers were Nacty Wells and Britt. They were massive targets. Um, we obviously made bids uh, to Bradford um, for Nacty. Uh, in fairness to the boy, I think he wanted to play higher, and I can understand and appreciate that. So, you know, uh, once it got to the stage where Bradford as well had had a few quid in cup runs, they weren't really desperate for the money. So no matter what we offered him, we, you know, we, we went all the way up to 1.5. Um, it wasn't going to happen. So obviously Britt was another target. And, and the reason we'd gone for Nacty heavily was because we were told there was no way Watford would let Britt come. They were probably going to put him out on loan. And what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to sell a striker and bring one in on loan. Because you bring a striker in on loan who wins the Golden Boot and scores goals, he's of no value monetary-wise to Peterborough United Football Club. So... We then, what I did was, when we, we couldn't, you know, the Nacty Wells thing wasn't happening and, you know, we knew Britt was on, I said to Barry, listen, get your ass down to the Watford training ground because we played them here in a game and John Frank had told Darren that he wasn't in his plans. So he went down and he spoke to uh, their director of football, he's an Italian guy, and Barry rang me and he said, look, the only way they'll let him out is if we give them seven figures. I said, he's 20. I said, you know, he wasn't prolific as, as the Nacty Wells last year. What value did I see in it? And I thought, well, he's 20. We did the deal over a long period of time, so it wasn't you know a million straight away, million plus straight away out of our budget. We felt we could improve him, and we felt we had a player that could play at the very highest level, so he'd be worth a lot of money to us. So, and we also felt we had a player that would win the Golden Boot. So I said to Barry, I'll give them what they want under one condition: he's in the car with you on the way to Peterborough in the next hour. This was at six o'clock at night. He's on one of those who believe that you snooze, you lose. So they were targets. Um, so we got him. Jack Payne was a massive target because he'd done so well for us, it was important that we got that deal done. So we did the deal with Scally. We'd agreed a fee for Jamie Patterson. He was one I had the real uh, excitement over, because I thought he would be a perfect replacement for Lee Tomlin. I kind of foresaw the, the issues we were going to have with Tomo as regards to wanting to leave. Yeah. So for me, Patterson was one I'd watched. I'd, I'd actually gone and see him myself a couple of times as well. I was very excited about him playing that number 10 role. Um, we agreed a fee, 750 grand with Walsall. We were then, obviously when we agreed the fee, Forrest then came in. And we were then told the boy's a big Forest fan from as a kid. So Jimmy was an ex-Walsall coach and whatever, and he was also talking to the boy. In fairness to the boy, he wanted to play for Nottingham Forest. It's Peter reunited, so what can you do? So we lost out on that one. Who else did we agree a fee for? Uh, I'm just trying to think back because it feels like five years ago. Um, there were other players we agreed fees for, I'm sure, in the summer. 
but again they were they went higher. So as a championship club, you've always got a great chance 90% of the yeah. time of taking the targets you want. As a League One club, players only want to play higher, so you, you can't blame them for that, you know. So there were a few other ones we lost that fell through the cracks, but say la vie. You uh, both yourself and Darren spoke very positively at the uh, start of the season and through pre-season, really. Mm. You know, stating that it's it's a, it's a league to be won, and sure. I think that was very much your target. Massively. Well, at what stage this season did you start thinking actually it's not going to happen? When we won ten of the first twelve games, I thought, believe it or not, um, peak too soon, sort of job. No, no, we didn't peak. We haven't peaked at all. Um, we the first 10, 12 games, I believe, we won a lot of games with the opposition in fear of us, um, and we started with a point to prove because of how we were relegated. So it was a great start, but. I knew personally we weren't playing great in those ten wins. You know there wasn't. There was a few games we destroyed teams. Reading, we destroyed uh, Tranmere, we battered Notts County. But there were other games where we felt we were not playing as well as we could. You know, and it was like I I I I, I worried even when we were winning. But that's me, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, I felt looking at this league we could win this league. I felt with the squad we were only losing to White Gap. So because Pritch didn't really play that much for us because of his injury again. So it wasn't like he was going to be a massive you know deal changer. And I felt once we were going to keep Tom up, we didn't need that number 10 replacement then. And I just felt, as a league, we were going to do great things. And my mistake probably wasn't enforcing that we should have got another strike partner for Brett in the summer, like we've done with, say, Connor and with Nicky coming back. That was my mistake. We went a certain way. I think it was Ty and Brett who played well and whatever, target man. So I love a bit of pace up front. I just think it brings our fans alive. It makes us a different team. We built our promotion teams on the pace of you know the Mac attack. You know, with Boydie supporting that. So we had Tomlin, we had Brett. We probably needed one more quick one alongside Brett. That was probably a big mistake. And I just felt that once we'd lost a couple of games with the whole Celtic issue and fiasco with Tomo, you know, things took a turn for the worse. And that horrible word inconsistency came up and we just suddenly fell into a lull and maybe people weren't as fearless anymore against us. And our own players then started playing below their own standards. And it's just been a kind of case of that. I mean, the first three months of the season we won 13 drew two and lost three mm. and that that's incredible form and it, mm. going into november i suppose that sort of changed everything didn't it yeah i mean even at christmas i think when we beat bradford here we were only eight points off the top so you still felt we had a chance but like i said you know i didn't think we were playing terrifically well we were winning a lot of games which is a good sign of a team you know you're not playing well and you're winning games but eventually your luck runs out you can only play averagely so many times without suddenly people catch on to you and you lose and we lost a lot of average games, no offence to some of the teams we lost against. You know, we beaten by Stevenage at home, we got beaten Colchester uh, away. You know, and again, you know, their teams compared to us and, the, you know, the budgets and everything else, that should never really matter. But let's be fair, we, you know, we should have been beating teams like that and not drawing enough games. You look at a Preston, who have drawn 17 games and we've drawn three or four and lost 16 games. You know, just that consistency, we just failed to find it and players fell out of form. Tomlin was getting red cards every second game, you know, injuries, Rowie always had a problem with his hamstring or an injury, so there was just all these things were creeping in. Yeah. Um, so I woke up one day and I felt, you know, how have I fallen asleep at the wheel and, and allowed this to happen for my club? You know, where I've woken up and we suddenly got a few players who are out of contract, a few players maybe who, who aren't playing for the future, so I don't want to be here. Um, you know, a strike force that's not as quick and as pacey as you'd like, or number 10 wants to leave. Um, you know, our crowds are unhappy, our football's not magnificent and, you know, I'm looking at the team, there's a lot of players who are 26, 27, 28 and they're out of contract and that wasn't a typical Peter United side for me to own and I'm thinking, how do I wake up and let this happen? I was going to say, is it... Is and it, I did fall asleep at the wheel. Is it, is it a hindrance? Is it, is it frustrating for you that you live in the States and you're unable to... As no, you speak, because you know, you've got a manager and a staff and I can only support the gaffer as best I can by bringing in players and... You know, by giving him the management staff he wants, and that's another thing. You got massive management staff. I've got a defensive coach, and you know, I've got uh, you know goalie coaches. I've got sports science. It's massive. People don't understand. It's a big backroom staff, and they have to take responsibility and do their jobs. But you've I'm just trained so yourself there, and said yeah, because I've no, because I've got to think. Well, should I in the summer, you know, have been a bit more stronger with the players who didn't want to sign new contracts and say, no matter what, you're getting sold in the summer. You know, my rule personally always was: you don't let players run a year down on their contract. Should they have gone in the summer? You know, and then you think that, you know, and, and I'm thinking, should I sell Lee Tomlin in the summer? Should we have, you know, brought more players? And we thought, well, we're losing Gale, we got Brits, so we're fine. You know, should I have said, well, hang on, we've still got four or five, you know, out of contract. Some want to sign, some don't. Mm. So the ones who don't, maybe do you move on? There was a bit of that creeping in, you know, and, and you know, our front pair, you're going to have a big one and you're going to have a, a pacey one. You know, we built our sides on 
flair, pace, and, and you know, good football and attacking football and, and you know, entertaining the crowd and scoring loads of goals. And you know, again, you look at it and you go, you know, how did this quite happen? But look, it is what it is. You know, it is. The season's not over. I really feel. You know, there's, there's mistakes been made, and I'll learn from those. And I have to take responsibility. I said it before: I'm the man at the top. I'm the man who pays the bills. I'm the man who makes the big decisions. Managers, you know, it's easy to blame managers and management staff. And of course, he's got a great squad. And you know, we've underachieved, and the manager knows that. The team's underachieved, and he's underachieved. They all know that. However, our target was silverware, and our target was to get back to the championship. Of course, it was to league, win the league. We're miles off winning the league, but championship football is all that matters. So. You know, I've got to look at that. That's the flip side to it. You mentioned uh, there about Lee Tomlin. I mean, mm. without speaking illly of him, as he's not here. Sure. Uh, how frustrating was that period for you? Because I mean, you, you've been out publicly and said yeah. Tomlin was your favourite I'll player. Never, I'll never speak illy of him. He's a, he's a silly dickhead sometimes. You know what I mean? With some of the, the the stuff he does, he knows that himself. But he's such a talent. I mean, fans didn't you know give him iconic status. Was what a player he is. You know, and, and the problem with Tomlin was is yeah, it's like everything else. He wants to play as high as he can. And he was genuinely devastated that someone came in and paid six million for Dwight Gale and didn't offer the same for him. He, he that's the way Tomo thinks, you know. He's like, well, you know, I, I score goals, I've created goals. I'm not a striker. I, I play as an attacking midfielder, you know. Mm. Why am I not getting the Premier League move? I think that devastated him. We then started the season and we, you know, he destroyed Reading and he destroyed, you know, he destroyed a lot of teams, you know. And Tomo, at his maximum, can play anywhere he wants. He's that good, but he lets himself down there because. The selfie thing all happened and happened when we were playing a game. The deadline's closed in four hours in Scotland. It just couldn't happen. You know, it couldn't happen. You know, plenty of notice all summer. If someone comes in with the right deal and tries to buy you, you know, we'll do what we can if we're given time to replace well, you. But the catalyst is yeah. steering his head. Yeah, yeah, of course it was, because any player who suddenly turned down the chance to play Champions League football, I couldn't. We'd sell to a game. I couldn't sell our best player, you know, when we'd won our first five games or whatever we won. Uh, what kind of, on deadline day, what kind of message is it sent out to our fans? What kind of message is it sent out to the dressing room, you know? But the flip side to it is, I, I learned from that, it's, it's, you know, it was like a gun to my head. Did, did it have time to battle. travel to you in that sense? Because you were in the States at the time. No, I was it? here. Oh, you were here. I was here. So I got what, a phone call two hours before the game. So what sort of Celtic pressure offered would, did a, you feel? I felt massive pressure. Celtic have offered a million pounds for Lee Tomlin. You're joking me. A million quid. Behave. And then his agent's on. He's not going to play today. Don't, don't you dare pick him. All this pressure. Then I get to the stadium, half two, again as agent, they've made the bid up to 1.2 million. But, you know, don't pick him, he won't play today. The boy himself's going to the manager before the game, I, I, you know, I want to go to Celtic. And we're saying to him and his agent, well, you'll have no time to go for a medical and no time to agree terms. Oh, don't worry, he's going to do a medical an hour away and uh, terms don't worry about. So you tell me what's going on. So then during the game, our football secretary comes up to me and goes, there's another bid. Now it's up to two men. And this is during the game. And the boy himself then, who substitute, is checking his phone during the game because his agent telling him there's another bid. He then steams into the manager after the game. You know, there's a massive row downstairs in the manager's office about that. You know, you, you can't stop me going to Celtic. It's a dream move, and I understand where he was coming from. But I need him to understand where I was coming from. And I said to Lee, it doesn't matter because you'll be the best player in this league and you will have your choice of 10 clubs in January or in the summer. But he went the other way. Instead of putting his head down, and being the best player in the league till January and getting his pick of Premier League clubs to move to, no disrespect to Celtic. He went the other way and got sent off and had red cards and had problems and issues and oh, what can you do? Mm. So you can go one way or the other. He went the other way. And then we had in the window, Middlesbrough were sniffing around and came in and no, we didn't get as much as Celtic offered, but the player was practically threatening to fly to America and see me and knock on my front door if we didn't allow it to happen. And at that point, he was on his third red card, I think. One more red card, it was like a 10 or 12 game ban. And you're just thinking, you know what? It just ain't worth it. Let him go. There were also uh, a few other, you know, strange moves throughout the season, I suppose. Mm. I mean, you look at, you spent a lot of money on Tyrone Barnett, mm. um, you know, money on Emil Sinclair. Mm. Uh, and, and at a time, Not I suppose... Not on money back on Sinclair. Yeah, but at a time when I suppose we were looking for strikers, looking for, I suppose, a regular partnership mm -hmm. with... Uh, with Brit, what, 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 was, what was the surroundings behind that? What, why did all this go on? Um, well, you know, Tyrone was an enigma, you know, we, look how good he was in his first 10 games for us in the championship. Again, he's another, it's all about players applying themselves. Because you can spend the money and you can give them the platform, they've got to do it themselves. And he started great for us and then it was the fitness level. And I still think there's an issue there, you know, where he needs to get his fitness levels up. He was never quite 100%. And he started the season well. 
and then the standards fell. But we don't really play to a target man's strengths, you know. But I believe Ty will have a good career elsewhere, um, and he was never really, you know, what we're all about. But management felt that in the championship we needed a plan B and a different type of striker, and that's why we went out and bought him. We were told he was the best plan B in the country. So I can only back a lot of money to spend on the plan B. Yeah, there was a lot of money to spend, but we've had almost half of that back in loan fees. So, you know, people have to stop worrying about what was spent in Tyrone Roman. By the time you sold, we'll have all of our money back. So, you know, you're not always going to get them right. And um, that's football. And we take plenty of punts and we invest big sometimes. Tyrone Roman was one we invested big on, and his age was probably on the wrong side of investing big, but we still did it because he was plan B. And we felt with that three, four, five year plan in the championship, he was going to be a very good plan B. But players have to help themselves, they have to apply themselves, they have to work hard themselves and they have to make it happen. Mendes is another example. We felt he was the best player for us in the last 10 games of the championship. He was, he was a world beater, scoring wonder goals at Millwall, at Crystal Palace, running through his championship defences. We felt uh, he was going to be a big part for us this year, his pace and his guile and his impact. And He came back from pre-season, everyone knows how he came back from pre-season. You can't control that as a football club. He's still only 21. We've invested a lot of money in him. I'll be having a chat with him very soon. It's one of those things. Do you want to have a career and play at the top or do you want to end up playing non-league football? Players have to help themselves. There's only so much I can do. And when a player comes pre-season, ready for this big season we're into, and he's two stone overweight, what are you meant to do? You know, and this is half of the problem with footballers. They don't know how lucky they are, how privileged they are, and the opportunity they have. And they have to help themselves. So. The striker situation was a bad one we found ourselves in. Yeah, Ty came in, did well at the start, and then fell out of the team, and then obviously, you know, went off to Bristol City, and he hasn't lit the place on fire there like he should do, and they have an option to buy him, and they probably won't buy him unless he gets his act together. That's down to the player. There's only so much we can do as a football club. Um, probably one of the biggest departures, I suppose, of the season was uh, Gabriel Zakwani. Yeah. I mean, t tell us about Gabs that. Gabs emailed me two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a little bit of a shock to people, because mm. a lot regarded him as one of the best centre-halves we had. No, you know, you, you, you have to be, look, you know, there's no, there's no room and no place for sentiment and, uh, you know, to get in the way in football. Gabby was brilliant for us. Did I think he was brilliant for us this season? I think he'd agree himself. He felt that that was on standards. Um, I know the fans remember him as a legend and think he should be out there every week, but he wasn't going to sign a new deal and then he did want to sign a new deal and, you know, all of that, but we've just felt with Gabs. We invested a lot of money in Gabby, he had some great promotions, and he'd always be a legend to me, and always be welcome back here. But we just felt it was the right time to move on. You know, some people have been here too long, and there's been a bit of that this season. There's been a lot of players that maybe have been here too long, and it's time to move on. So I always said about re-energising. Some players, it should be a two, three year career at a club, and then you move them on, usually for big money. And that's kind of our policy. Um, and it just felt the time, he wasn't getting in the Gaffer's team. He was one of the big earners here on the wage bill. And he had a magnificent opportunity to go and earn a few quid in Greece. And we just felt it was the right thing to do. Nobody wanted to buy him. Um, so we weren't going to get a return on it. So we thought, look, we're going to reinvest and bring in a, a young centre back in January or in the transfer window. So we let Gabs go. We felt we were well covered. We have Brisley, we, we obviously have Bozzy. And like Purcell can play there, Alcock can play there. We were buying a new centre half and we were loaning in a centre half, hopefully to buy him as well. So we were planning for the future and we didn't let sentiment get in the way. But Gabby's still a big posh fan. And uh, I still speak to him. One of your uh, favourite ways, I suppose, of venting frustrations mm -hmm. has been uh, uh, via Twitter, on sure. social, on social media. Sure. Uh, now, have you ever written anything and then thirty seconds after thought, damn, maybe I shouldn't have written? No, no apologies, because I'm honest, I'm truthful, I'm the first person to praise my football club, its fans, and its players when we play well, and the management staff. And I don't slag my players off every week. It's probably been three, four times I've done it because I've wanted to strangle them, like our fans have. And they deserved it. And the players might turn around and say, oh, the chairman's a dickhead for doing that. He's always, well, how dare they? They put me in a position to do it because they've let me down and they've let the fans down. You know, they have to set their own standards. If they fall below those standards, you're damn right they expect criticism. You know, the fans pay money, they can criticise. I pay their wages, I can criticise. Because nothing I say on Twitter isn't what I'd say to a player's face or to the manager's face. Are they unhappy with me about doing it? Probably. Do I care? No. Do your job. If you do your job, I won't have an issue. You know? Um, it's sort of divided opinion, hasn't it, on Twitter? I mean, yeah, <laughs> but that's you, not my you get praised for it and you get, and you get course, abuse for you it. You always get people who's very unprofessional. Shouldn't do that. Why? You paying their wages? Is it your money? You putting your neck in the line? I do. I've got every right to do it. What am I meant to do? Bite my lip all the time? I've done it too many times. So, yeah, if I come out and say, 
We were poor. We were crap. We didn't deserve to win. Our players were poor. They need to get their act together. They do need to get their act together. So, you know, there's no point in being two-faced. It's exactly what I would say to the players in the dressing room or I would say to them here, they will meet them. Oh, it's exactly the same thing. The players know where they stand with me. You know, there's no middle ground, you know, with me. You know, you're paid to go out and perform and not let your club down. Go and do that. I accept in football, you lose football games. But a squad like that and the players we have losing 16 games is outrageous. Has the manager ever caught here of any of your, of course he has, of your tweets and, and been, our, and been I, I, in touch? I know our kit man's on Twitter. I know his staff will be on Twitter. I'll say the gaffer probably secretly goes on Twitter, you know. <laughs> you imagine, probably you know to turn a laptop on. But, you know, <coughs> of course he knows. Of course he does. Has he brought it up to me? Has he complained to me? Not once. Why would he? He hasn't got a leg to stand on. What can he say? How is your relationship with him uh, these days? I mean, is it uh, as good now as we sit here as, as it was yeah. when we were back to back in the championship? Why well, wouldn't it be? It's better. How supportive have I been? Last year, losing 14 in the first 18 games, you should have got a bullet. Everyone else did around us. The three teams around the bottom of us at the time all fired their managers. Two, I think three or three of them stayed up. Who was the fool? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I've given them support. And the gaffer, I mean, listen, we still have Rouse, we still have Rooks. Um, we had a, did we have a ruck last week? Two weeks ago, you know what I mean? Before Wembley, we had a ruck. Of course we do. It wasn't a big ruck. Yeah, we were speaking a, an hour later. No big deal. Um, we have a great relationship. I've seen him at uh, Wembley, saw him yesterday, the day before yesterday, today, this morning. We've gone over youth budgets, plan A's, plan B's, did it all yesterday. Um, we still have banter. We have good days, we have bad days. Um, this season has absolutely frustrated the life out of him as much as it has for me. And, and, any other manager with his budget and his back in the 16 losses, he'd have been gone as well. I think now he's the sixth longest lasting manager in the, in the Football League. So I've supported him, I've given him everything they want, everything they need. I've put my hand in my pocket over and over. It's up to them to repay that now. You know, and, and what's the point in changing the manager in January, or February, or March? Has it been hard for you to change? Because this is, we know the way you work in business, we, mm -hmm. we know the way you, I mean, you've, you've sat there and explained yourself. Mm -hmm. How difficult has it been for you to change and actually bite your lip and think, well, listen, I've got, I've got to see this through. I can't, I I can't just get rid of him now. I don't bite my lip. Oh, I, tell him, I, just, uh, I tell him if I'm dissatisfied and I'm not happy and some of the things that happen and some of the decisions. And it's not me interfering. Yeah, if we go I'm giving an opinion. Yeah. But what, what, what I've got to do is I've, I've also set him out a target hmm. and he's still on, tar on target himself to achieve what we set out. And that was to win the JPT and to get promotion to the championship. Yeah, to win the league. He hasn't done that, but... The carrot, the carrot at the end was the championship. We need to be a championship club again. And he's still in line to do that. And there's no other person I would trust more to win promotion for a football club than Darren Ferguson. The manager doesn't set out to lose 16 games in a season. Um, you know, he doesn't set, out, set us up to play badly. Um, so no matter the criticism he gets, the flack he gets, this is a man under massive pressure himself. You know, going into Wembley and losing two league games. And, you know, sometimes you have to take the pressure out of the situation because he's a human being. And he's still young in his management career, in my opinion. So I have to, at times, do my best to lift him because, of course, I'll knock him down myself. I'm his biggest critic, and that's between me and him. But then I have to lift him as well. He's a human being, and I have to remember that and appreciate that. And he hasn't become a bad manager overnight, having a team that's lost 16 games. He managed the club from January to May. He's one of the top four clubs in the championship, you know, on a budget nowhere near everyone else's, which proves he's a bloody good manager. You know, so everything that's happened this season has been testing. And I've said to him, when we get promotion, you know, what a great experience it's been. How difficult is it for you to, to see all the comments, negative comments mm. uh, on social media regarding, you know, people saying to you, listen, I want my money back, or mm. why isn't Darren Ferguson gone? Mm. You know, threads on forums saying Fergie out. How frustrating is that for you as, as owner of this football club to, to see people like that talking about? <sighs> you know, obviously I, I block people, you know, and then I'm, I've retweeted a few people because that gives them a bit of stick from the real fans. People who pay the money can have an opinion. I have no problem with that at all. Just don't overstep your boundary. You know, don't come at me from a place of personal insults and everything else. You know, don't overstep. You can fans will always want managers out when teams aren't playing well and losing. And the inconsistency in losing four games, losing five games, losing three games, all that, it's driving our fans mad. And the gaffer said we created a monster. He's right. Our fans expect success. I tell them we're going to win the league. We're languishing in sixth place. So they're unhappy about that. But like I said, we've won the trophy. We now want to get up and kick on and go into the championship. So it's been frustrating. The crowds have been the most frustrating thing for me. Yeah, we'll talk about the crowds in a mm. moment. I mean, we sit here and we're kicking up all the dirt about how mm. frustrating it's been this season, the inconsistencies, etc. But 
I mean, we, we, we seem to forget, don't we, that this still could be possibly the most successful season in the club's history. These players and managers could have a chance to be at Wembley twice in the space of eight weeks, be championship players again and be trophy winners. I mean, how that, is, that is how good it could be. As bad as it's been, as bad as everyone is like having a go and having a pop and sack the manager and da 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 and, you know, crowds are like disappearing, look at what season it could be. How did so. it feel stepping out of Wembley as owner of uh, a football club, your football club? Brilliant. Uh, in in such a in, a in a major trophy and winning it. Brilliant because I always wanted trophies to fill in the trophy cabinet. It was always something I set out to do. I wanted to win League Two. I wanted to win League One. Um, we've had playoff trophies. I wanted the cup. It was the FA Cup of the lower leagues. It was a target. I love fulfilling targets. I love achieving something where you set out to achieve and. and to see the, I was delighted for the city, not just the fans that came, but the city itself, the council and what they're doing with the stadium. It was great for the city to be on the map again, you know, and winning that FA Cup of League One and League Two. And, and to see 20,000 fans embrace it that day out, backed up why it was so important to win the Cup. People were saying, you know, why is it so important and it's going to distract from the league? And it hasn't, you know what I mean? If anything, it's been a, a, a refreshing, you know, getaway from the league. And I just. I just think that day at Wembley can galvanise us and I wrote a big letter to the manager a few days before the Wembley game after we lost to Preston and the title of it was Galvanise and the galvanising effect that a good day at Wembley and a victory at Wembley and taking the trophy on what it will do for our club, what it will do for our players and what it will do for his staff and he has to use that as a galvanising effect to kick on now and, and that's how important it was because it can go either way. That's what I said to him, you've got to kick on, you've got to use Wembley to galvanise and you've got to win seven out of the last eight games and really go for it. And we, we'll either achieve it or we'll die trying. But let's leave it all out there. And, and all I want to see is uh, the opposition teams have eight man of the match performances for their goalkeeper. Because that's what always keeps me happy. I always say, I don't mind Peterborough losing as long as I feel their goalie was man of the match. Yeah. If I fully, feel he went on holiday or on a cruise like the Sheffield United goalkeeper did, then I'm devastated. Because I just feel we didn't, uh, we didn't set out to do what we should do. I mean, you sit, you, you sit there, you, you worry, you stress, mm -hmm. you criticise. Mm -hmm. What do you ever sit there and and reflect and and look at what you've achieved in such a short amount of time? Really, if, if you think about how long the football club's been in existence yeah. and what you've actually achieved in this short, do you ever sit back and? No, I, I, you know, yeah, I, I saw an article in the ET today about you know the, the greatest chairman you know in Peter's history and three trophies and or sorry three playoffs and three promotions and one trophy and all that and. I love seeing that, my ego loves seeing that, it's wonderful, but I'm not one of those people that rests on my laurels, I, I'm always looking for the next big thing to do, the next big achievement, and like I said to you before, we stay in the championship, we'd be top 12 this year, playoffs next year, I always want to evolve and get better and whatever, and this is, I'm, uh, I, I'm so happy to have a trophy like that and a day out for my club and the city and the players and what it could do for the rest of the season, but now I'm thinking I want to win the playoffs, just straight away when we got the trophy and I'm down there doing interviews, it's like right now we've got to get back in the playoffs and win. Uh, back to the championship, and you're asking me in the summer, what are my next targets? And there's going to be something else. It's just who I am. You know, I don't like sitting still. I think if you sit still, it's a very dangerous thing to do. People fail to realise uh, just how much it costs to actually yeah. own a football club. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the fact that you're able to bring a football club up to a point where it's more or less able to wipe its own nose mm. every season. Just how difficult is that, and how much of a stress have you have you found that, especially this season? Massive. This. Well, I put it. I think what is it? I put another million in in January. So you know that I shouldn't have needed to put in, but I needed to put in because we needed to bring new players in. So, um, and also because the crowds have killed us this season. So from a budget point of view, we're way below. Um, but the tap's got to stop at some point. Of course, and, and it did. When we were in the championship, we were pretty self-sustainable. We were doing it. We were turning a profit, and I was getting some money back, and it was it was working. And that's what I said to you. The other flip side, the four or five years in the championship is, is that I'm paid back and. Peter United have got no debts, our crowds are growing, our income's growing, we're wiping our nose. The, the, the one benefactor is completely paid back, which we were on target to do over that four or five years, and that was the 54 points kick in the nuts. So now this season, everyone's thinking we well, got the Gailey money, but yeah, you know, we spent three of it on players, and then you know, we obviously had to put up the shortfall in for you know, being in this league compared to being in the championship, and then obviously people stopped coming to see us. and, and we don't beat Kidderminster in the cup, and that's a three hundred grand turnaround because they knock out Sunderland and the prize money. And I then spend money on Baldwin and money on Washington and whatever. So I put a million in in January, which was never planned. So again, it's the same old thing. But that's my job, and that's why when people moan at me and say, "Well, make it a fiver and make it cheaper," and you're too expensive and whatever else is, well, you know, uh, 
you want us to be a competitive team and you want us to compete for playoffs and winning titles and winning trophies and I'm putting my money where my mouth is and whatever, I need your support. It's very much a rock and a hard place, isn't it? it is. without, the, without the fan base, you're not going to generate the money to bring in the players. Listen, I appreciate it. People coming out and saying, well, we're not millionaires like you and we're not rich like you. Yeah, it's fine, but it's not like I'm sitting here draining the club of money, taking it all one way and not putting any in. All I'm asking for is what we've had before. Last time we were at this level, we had better crowds. Um, yeah, in League One, I mean, it wasn't that much more expensive to come and watch us, so what's the difference? Then people say, well, the product's no good and the football's crap. And then they say, well, real fans, like Leeds fans, for example, as regards to there's 30,000 of them, they tweeted me last night saying, you know, we're losing four or five games at home and we're still coming. And when I say real fans, it's not a detrimental to Peterborough. I'm just trying to compare the fact of Portsmouth fans, I said it before, they're getting 15,000 every week in League Two, no matter what. No matter what's going on at the club, financially, results-wise, they're coming. And all I want the people in Peter to be is consistent. And if we were getting last time in League One, when we were in the playoffs as well, we were getting, I think, 2,000 people more at the same price. Yeah. So I don't understand why the sudden turn off in love for the football club, what's happened. Then you get 20,000 people got to Wembley, and yeah, I appreciate they all spent money for their families going for a big day out, and great. But it doesn't make 4,000 show up on a, a Wednesday to a game. We couldn't have got 6,000, like we were getting three years ago in League One, and uh, I don't get it. I genuinely can't get my head around it, and they got fans tweeting me going, but we're going to Wolves. Great, and it's brilliant to have your support at Wolves, but it doesn't go in the club's coffers. <laughs> you know, loads of people know we're going to Wolves, brilliant, but it's not going in the club's coffers. It's not helping me, it's not helping the football club. I'd rather you come to the Gillingham game, I'd rather you come to the Colchester game. Forget about going to the Wolves game. You know, and that, that's where fans have to realise. So, I haven't moaned that often, but I am moaning at the moment, because it's getting to me. It's really getting to me. You know, and, and I said it before, if we don't hit our season ticket target, you know, that'll just devastate me. Luckily that started well. But these attendances that are dropping, people keep saying it's down to the price and the performance of the football, but come on, we're, we're always in the top six, we're always competing, we're competing for trophies. I'm doing my bit. I'm making sure the club is always competing for something to keep you excited. So why aren't people coming? So three years ago, the economy was a lot worse than it is now, and they were coming. Three years later, the economy's a lot better and people are stopping coming. So if that continues, that's going to be a big problem for well, me. I was going to say, how, how long can that continue for? And you've, got, you've got to be realistic with this. because I've always said the fans will keep me here as long as I feel they want me here. Mm. And if they stop coming, I'll feel they don't want me here. So I've got a stadium that I'm paying mass rent on. It costs me a fortune. I've got a team I'm putting my money into all the time to make it a good product and bring trophies home and trips to Wembley. I need the city support. I need the fan support. If I don't get that, I have to look at making a decision for myself, <laughs> my family, because I'll give up my all for this football club, but if I feel I'm not getting a return from the people out there, then I have to look at that and make a business. Do you think that it will get harder next year? We've obviously financial fair play coming into uh, it. Massively, and this is what fans don't understand. I can't do the sponsorship deal like I did before. Financial fair, they're all looking at you now. You can't do things like I did before, you know, to get around the 60% rule. And we were going through budgets yesterday. And if I don't get the fan support, I, how am I going to be able to produce a budget and a, and a, a really competitive budget to, to if we're in this league and, and it's a plan B and touch what it's not? How am I meant to produce a, a, a team that's going to basically go out and, and, and win the title next year? You know, if they don't do it this year and get promotion. So without the fans adding their bit and whatever else, we can't keep pushing the envelope and pushing the boat and bringing players in. It's very, very difficult. So I really, really do need the fan support. And, People say, well, you, you don't do enough marketing, you don't do, you know, do the side to that, we do. <laughs> you know, we do, we do a massive amount of work in the community, we do a massive amount to get fans in through the door. Um, you know, really, last night was a real kind of, after Wembley, I was really, really down last night. I spoke to my wife and just said, you know, I really thought it would be a real homecoming from Wembley. You know, really, I, I actually said, you know, we get six, six and a half tonight. Really, really did think, you know, and I know it was expensive at Wembley, but surely there was 2,000 people out there that would pay it in 20 five quid or whatever else to, to come and see us last night and, and you know, uh, revel in our trophy uh, win and uh, obviously see a really good performance. So, yeah, that was a real kick in the cojones last night. What, I mean, as a football club, we're very much focused on the future, sure. uh, developing the future. I mean, mm -hmm. we see the, the stadium now being redeveloped. Uh, which would create a better match day experience mm -hmm. overall once all complete. We've got Great plans for that, yeah. Uh, ticket initiatives going out to, throughout the community, school partnerships that are, are starting to take the place. Work, people are criticising all the time, and I, I see all these stupid threads about we don't run a business and we don't have a businessman running the business. They all think I'm some mug. Look at what I've done over the seven years I've owned the club. I brought in nearly 25 million in transfer fees. We were promotions, we won trophies. 
the service we offer is second to none compared to what it was when I first came here. The machine we've put in place, the ticket systems we've put in place, the CRM we've put in place, you know, the the the, the commercial revenue, the sponsorship we bring in, it's like seven times the amount it was when I first came here. The, the strides we're making are like massive. You guys know that working at the club, it's like a different place when I first bought the club. So they almost feel like, you know, they love from the outside just throwing stones all the time and saying, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not. The work we do is unbelievable to increase attendances. You get people tweeting, I'll put on a bus to bring people in from here and there. Do this, do that. Go towards the Polish community. They think I don't do any of these things or try and do these things and whatever. The amount of times I've put on cheap matches and it's made absolutely no difference whatsoever. Trust me, I do everything in my power with the staff I have at the club to increase our attendances. I could drop the price to 12 quid tomorrow. We'd still have had four and a half thousand last night. I probably could have charged fifty quid last night. We'd still have four and a half thousand last night. It's my argument. And it's important, you know, to 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 I suppose breed a new generation of posh fans. You know that. And, and, and Me and you went through this last week. We're, we've got a massive project in place for the youth, for for the for that young age bracket to make them posh fans for the next fifty years. And we're putting that into place. You know, new newborn babies in the city are going to start getting gifts from Peter United, and you know the stuff we're doing is like unbelievable. This is a massive city now. The amount of people that live in this city, a city this large, the football club should have fifteen thousand every week. So we're working all the time on that. But I need help. I need you know, I, I don't know what's going on. My people have fallen out of love with my football club. You know, because that seems to have happened. You take it personally. Don't I you? do take it personally. Yeah, because it's a. Uh, I do everything in my power to make it successful and I expect in return fans to support that and the fans to show me they want me here and the way it's going at the moment is I'm, I'm not seeing that so I do take it personally and they're saying you can gripe and you can moan all you want and blah 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 well okay fine I'll keep griping I'll keep moaning and if it doesn't change trust me I'll make a decision no one will like again would you say it's a rock and a hard place because you know people say where well, they come to London right they're paying 25 it's not. 28 they did it three years ago yeah, biggest recession the world's ever seen. We had crowds much bigger than this three years ago. You know, even in the championship. You know, forget about the away support. You know, still we had bigger support at home. You know, I don't care what people are saying. We're a top six team in League One. Um, we've had periods in the season which have been very successful. We've had a great cup run. I've taken the city to Wembley. We don't deserve crowds of 4,500 or 4,300. We've had four or five of them this season. We don't deserve that as a football club. So we do everything we can and, you know, Everyone has to do their bit. So we've got, what, four home games left? Um, those crowds need to be decent. Is that the hardest thing of, is that the hardest thing about being a, the chairman of mm -hmm. Peter United at the moment? Really? Because I'm not talking about previous people who might own football clubs and for them get bigger crowds means more money in their pocket. Mm -hmm. I don't even take petrol <laughs> for, for being chairman of this football club. It cost me 17 grand for my flight tickets to fly in for one year. 17 grand to bring myself and my wife in because it was like an uh, American break and stuff like that, so flights were crazy. So we paid 17 grand for two flight tickets to come to see us at Wembley. My wife flew back the next day. I don't build the club for that. You know, so when I talk about fans coming, it's only to help the budget, it's only to help the club, it's only to help the, everything about the football club. You know, so yeah, it frustrates me. People have to understand that, you know. It's been at League One, much lesser football league money. I'm paying a ridiculous amount of rent every month and rates and costs and everything. You, you wouldn't believe it. I still need to make sure the product is competitive and good and that we can compete at the top. So it's, it's just, it's very difficult. And I continue to put my own money in all the time. So I just, um, I just want to see that support reciprocated and, you know, uh, acknowledged. The bigger picture, I suppose, for the city is for people to really understand as well that the amount of money that the football club generates the city which go out to all across everything we did it we did a study on it between five to ten million a year the club brings in how much money did the city make off that uh, Wembley thing you know as regards to the endorsement the advertising the name of Peter have been up there you wouldn't believe it the money the club is worth to the city is, is millions I had this meeting with a council before when we were talking about the lease I think their answer was someone in the council said to me well yeah you say that but you know that's you know we build a few more houses they'll also bring a return in so that was the answer but you know we did a I, I spent thousands on getting a study done and we bring millions to the city of Peter millions my football club does I think since I've owned the club it's over 50 million has come into the city well, I think as well you you go above and beyond in the sense of I think you've just literally donated 70,000 pounds yeah I mean that, that, that's Hall. nothing to do with Peter and that's nothing to do with no, but it's, it's, it's Thorpe Hall which no, people, it, people will benefit from yeah absolutely um you know my mom went to cancer uh, 10 years ago it was like her anniversary and um 
Every year I donate to various organisations. We, we do free kicks and we do all the presents for orphanages and stuff for Christmas we did um, and, and underprivileged children. And I just felt I met with Sue Ryder and they were talking about the things they were doing and the new things they were building and I'm a big believer and a big fan of hospices and the work they do and it's very unrewarded and I just said okay I'll, I'll pledge some money um, and they said well we'll dedicate something in your mom's name and I said great fantastic happy and today I think I'm meeting them um, three kids who lost their relative their parents to cancer um, so I'm going to give them a tour of the club and have a chat with them because I lost my mom so I just think it's important um, I don't look for anything back from that it's, it's a coincidence that they're based around Peterborough um, I've always been a contributor of theirs over the years you know charity wise I just think it's important and finally, you know, let's take away all the gripe and all the frustrations. Mm. I mean, do you sit here now and, you know, you see that trophy beside you and you, you see that we are sixth in the league with a, a very exciting few games to go. Do, do you sit here with a smile on your face? Yeah, of course I do. I'm delighted. I'm really, really happy to have a trophy. Um, I want two. I want to buy two uh, first-class seats and fly them back to America at the end of May. So that's really important to me to do. Take them to bed if I have to. Um, I'm really optimistic because I watched the game last night and that was, for me, it was really important. I was saying to my gaffer, the gaffer before the game and everything else, you know, first 15 minutes would be really interesting because I need to see if the players now that galvanising effect from Wembley and I just thought last night they were at it. I thought the players last night, the, the tempo was magnificent. They were at it, should have been 5 or 6 nil. Probably a bit sloppy in the final third, but you see Danny Swanson, the tempo from him, like, you know, playing on the size of that pitch at Wembley and three days later, it's whatever, he was, he was a monster last night running around that pitch. Grant McCann back in there again, you know, playing like a 24-year-old with his energies. You know, Jack Payne looking like last season's player. Josh McQuaid looking like he's been at Peterborough for a few years. And then you got Connor and Britt absolutely tearing them apart, you know, because for me it's the two quick strikers. I love that. And then even all three of our subs coming on. Lloyd's exciting. Nicky, brilliant coming on. Probably upset he wasn't in the team. Um, I was just trying to think. Well, Vassal came Nicky, on, had a, had a broken toe, it was brilliant last night. And then I say the back, well... The two centre backs, I thought Brizzy was magnificent, you know, flawless. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just thought we were magnificent last night. You mentioned there, Nicky. I mean, Nicky, yeah. Nicky is more or less your new striker, isn't he? Yeah, we spent a lot of money on Nicky. And uh, what people don't realise is he's not a striker now. And people keep making that mistake. Nicky Josie has scored 20 goals this season from playing in midfield positions. He's played wide, he's played left, he's played in front of midfield, he's played in the hole. He's not played up front. And this is where people get it wrong. He's 21 years old. He scored nearly 20 goals and he has not played as a striker. Even when we've played him up front, so to speak, it's not. It's a 4-5-1 because he's never played up front. That's, I like to see two strikers. So I like to see Nicky in the team anyway because of what he brings to the team. Do you know what I mean? Like against Crew when we had both him and Swanee, you know, drilling down and, and you know, scoring goals. Um, so, yeah, Nicky's like a new signing and I think he could have a great run in and really, really re-energise his own career. So I'm, I'm chuffed for that because we spent a lot of money on Nick. Um, and I just, I looked at the team last night and they looked like a young, fresh team and they had a freshness about them and an energy about them and it was that galvanising effect, even though two or three of them didn't play at Wembley, they were galvanised by it and the crowd, there was a buzz of excitement, Lloyd was absolutely getting the crowd going crazy with his little runs at the end and injury time and that's what Peter was all about and I felt, you know, crowd, a lot of people missed that last night so seeing that last night gives me a lot of hope for the last seven games, I think we can win six or seven of them. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We go into that the playoffs with momentum. We've always said make it a three-game season. Nobody will fancy playing us. We're, we're usually very good in those games. Um, we've got a good history in the playoffs, and we certainly have a good recent history at Wembley. So what a magnificent thing to go back there and, and, and be a championship team again at the end of May and finally put those seven minutes to bed. Thanks for your time. Do you feel like you've had therapy? I feel like it's been good, Dr. Katz. Thank you. <laughs>